What's going on, everybody? We're back with another edition of the Crazy Face Uno podcast. I'm your host, Shane McNeely. Just a reminder, Crazy Face Uno is inspiring others to do good, to make a difference in our local and global community. And I am very pleased to welcome my father, David McNeely. Hello, everybody. I'm only partially responsible for this guy. (laughs) Welcome, Dad. Thank you. So, just to fill everybody in, if you're just tuning in and you haven't been following along throughout the entire uh, last couple weeks, uh, I am currently in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, The Pooch and I, Mr. Chancey Pooh, are traveling from Minnesota, and we are making our way down to Florida where my wife and uh, the rest of our family is, uh, and by the rest of our family, I mean just my wife, uh, <laughs> is is currently living. We're moving to Florida, and so Chance and I are road tripping down and have the ability to stop and see family. And You're currently and homeless. I am sh- currently homeless. No. Technically. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, we, uh, and it's been really great cause I've been able to catch up with you guys and, yep. um, spend a little time with family and relax a little bit. It's been quite, quite the sprint in the last, uh, couple months and it's been good to just relax, but I'm here with dad. So just like we did with my grandma and my mom, we're going to start from the beginning we're gonna we're gonna dig into the life of my father oh dear god go ahead (laughs) by the way my life is boring um dad why don't you start off see everybody says that actually everybody says the whole oh i don't have anything interesting about me and then they get on here and just like pulling pulling it out of them so and i also know that it's not true so (laughs) anyway you were born In what little town of West Virginia? Spencer, West Virginia. Spencer, West Virginia. Uh, And that's where you were brought into this world. Brought into this world. I was born in Spencer, brought into this world there. Grew up there till about the fifth grade and moved to the large, thriving metropolis of Akron, Indiana, not yeah. Ohio. Real, real, okay. uh, you just one trained. flashing red light in the middle of town, <laughs> just for everyone to know. Uh, if you go to Akron, there's a reason. Uh, you just don't yeah. pa- happen to be passing through there. It's true. In Spencer, we actually, I remember when I was younger, you, me, and mom, we went on a little road trip and we ended up going through Spencer. Yep. And I remember. Like blast from the past for you, I oh, know. Oh God, yes. Uh, it's like me going back to Sullivan, really. Uh, but yeah, it's funny because you were pointing out different things and things you remembered. I think you even like there was like numbers that you were remembering, like a phone number or something that like popped it, into your head. We or, had um, there was a, like I'll call her second mom, a mom babysat for kids, and her son Greg and uh, his sister Tammy Lynn. Yeah, like a sister, we fought like brothers and sisters. But um, we got there, and I didn't know Peggy's phone number, so I went and looked in the phone book and couldn't find it, and come to find out later she had an un- unlisted phone number. And it was a number that just kind of rang through my head, don't know why yeah. it, it was. wasn't going to try to call it because uh-huh. I was afraid to do that. We ended up going to Peggy's house. I knew where she lived and went there and knocked on the door, and we started chatting and visiting. And, and I told her what happened. I tried to remember her number, and for whatever reason, I told her, the only number I could remember, and again, 927-3093, why that rings in my head I have no idea yeah she said well that was our old number uh, and I was like are you serious and she said yeah we ended up getting an unlisted number because she worked with some sort of a semi-government job yeah but it was kind of crazy I couldn't remember that that resonated with me and that was indeed her telephone number yeah so I remember crazy. those I remember that like very vividly I remember just driving around and you kind of showing us some different places in town and I think we went by your house the old house where <clears throat> Mom and Dad rented when they lived in uh, Spencer. And there's a couple different houses, all within a, gosh, a ha- block area that yeah. they, they had moved from one to the other. I think, to be honest, probably uh, landlords were about the same. They everybody knew everybody, sure. so we were but there. We went by there, and they ended up buying a house up on up on the circle. Yeah, in area. West Virginia, in yeah. Spencer, they bought that out, little house, and it looked. 
I remembered it as a five, six, seven, eight year old kid as a big house, which you look at it now and just didn't yeah. look that. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it funny? I mean, I've talked about it on here a ton, but perspective is always just crazy the way, you know, I listen to some other podcasts and they mention that too, just like how our brains, how we remember things, you know, and we remember things how we, sometimes how we want to remember them. And it's not necessarily always the most accurate, but then you go back and you're like, oh, I didn't realize that was there. I thought it was over here. Well, what was funny though for me there was that um, one of the things I wanted to do is, you know, when you go to elementary school, you live in town, you walk to school. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. Uphill both ways. Right? Uphill both ways, <laughs> you know, through three feet of snow, uphill both ways. But <laughs> my mother was always very protective. So uh -huh. I was thinking it couldn't be as far as I thought that walk was. Yeah. You know, not horrible, but the drive it, or the walk itself was a little over a mile to okay. the elementary school. Yeah. But it was uphill both, both ways. <laughs> <laughs> but it was crazy. But I remembered it when I actually had to drive that to see what it was because I couldn't believe that, quote unquote, my mother let me walk to school. Yeah. Do that, which I didn't have a choice. What did it end up being? Just a little over a mile. Oh. And there was a swimming pool. And when I was a elementary age kid, we, you know, always walked to the pool. The pool opened mm -hmm. at 1 o'clock at, at every day. And I was, by the time the summer was over, the little black boy. Because I tanned so easily. I yeah. was just so Yeah, and you still dark. do. You always look so really dark. dark. And, uh, but I remember walking to the pool every day. If it wasn't raining, walk to the pool. Yeah. And uh, I'll peel that was your kids. Yeah. That was your thing. Yep. Yeah. What other, do you have any other memories from that time of your life? Or Oh, gosh. Uh, do you remember, like... Elementary school was somewhat of a blur. Mm-hmm. I got glasses when I was in third grade, been blind ever since. <laughs> and uh, then, let's see... Things, you know, growing up there, I was in Cub Scouts there. I was uh, played Little League Baseball there, a little ball diamond. Sure. Yeah, little things there. But I, those things. Fishing with my dad. Yeah. And they had little creeks and hollers and uh -huh. back in there you went back to and you'd fish. And I'd get set up in one little area and dad would go do whatever dad yeah. did, try to outfish me. You know? <laughs> but that's what we did. We'd go fishing out in those areas. And some of them seemed like a long way from home. They really weren't that way, that yeah. far. But it's fun. I know. So Paul, I call my grandparents, my grandpa, Paul, both of them. And Mamma and Paul is what I called them growing up. But um, I remember, I mean, some, when I was telling Grandma in the podcast with her, but that month basically that I spent with my grandparents that summer uh, when I was growing up I think I was like seventh or eighth grade somewhere in there you did it a lot through element through elementary and even high school yeah that was just that one month that it was like two weeks with you know your mm -hmm. your side of the family two weeks with the other side of the family and it's one of the most memorable times in my life and I'm so grateful for that time too because Paul's passed away right. um, and he passed away Within a couple of years of after, retirement. Of, yeah. and after me, you know, right. of me being there for that month. And so that was like one of my, it's a, my fondest memories of Paul. I mean, it's like, and maybe even some of them, not the only, but right. they're like the ones that stick with me big time. You know, there's other little ones. But the chiggers, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got... I got some nasty things. We can get into those stories later, but <laughs> woo. Um, yeah, but Paul was a big avid fisherman, and it's cool to like. I know he always told me stories when we were fishing, and I was there that week. You'd always tell me about fishing those streams and going through the creeks, uh, you know, in West Virginia. And he'd say you'd just walk up, you'd find these deep pools. And those were the ones you'd fish in. He goes, you'd pull the biggest fish out of there mm -hmm. in the smallest little spaces of places. And um, he's like, we always knew where they were. You know, we always knew these spots. And we'd walk the creek and do whatever. But, yeah, he's a typical fisherman. He lied. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the fish always get bigger the ones that got away. Yeah. Probably as he got older, too. <laughs> um, yeah, so then Spencer, West Virginia. And then this is this next part of is really interesting and it's kind of came out a little bit more you found i know the some of the letters between yeah. paul and and grandma of when you guys were moving 
in, uh, well, I'm not going to give the year of the date me. Well, 71. I was going into <laughs> fifth grade. Um, and uh, I was told, um, dad was kind of in a funk. Uh, yeah. I was told that uh, the place where he was working was shutting down the sawmill. Dad was uh, a lumber grader foreman at a place called Burke Parsons in Bowlby. It was a sawmill. He had a whole crew that worked for him and done it for years. And his dad, my grandfather, was like a national lumber inspector, so hardwoods yeah. and wood and all that kind of stuff has always been in our genes, so to speak. And but, it even goes back further than that from what? Grandpa Don, yeah, you know he yeah. he's other he, things as well. Paul's brother is you know done a Still lot living. of like genealogy yeah. and and has told a lot of stories too about. And I know they've got some of that paperwork that you know the genealogy stuff that shows like lumber are, and working with wood and, and lumber yeah. has been within our family for right. a lot of years, generations. off and on, yeah, yeah, all the way through. But Dad, uh, they were going to be shutting down the sawmill and running at that right uh, that time frame. Railroad ties only, which back in the day, all your railroad ties and your railroads was bigger, mm. and so they they were going to focus so on the railroad ties and our railroad ties and not be doing the sawmill anymore. And Dad yeah. was basically out of the job, going to be losing his job. And I found a letter that I will call it a venting letter. You know, yeah, Dad wasn't the most articulate when it comes to writing, sure. but he wrote a letter just basing it, uh, voicing his frustrations to the company how he felt uh, he was forced to, in essence, lie and how they were going to take care of the guys if they just hang on for a few more few more months for him so they made the transition, they'll take care of them. Yeah. And when they got the guys and his team started doing that, mm-hmm. that didn't come out that way. And yeah. Pretty frustrated. It, yeah. Well, that, and that's, like, very much who he was, you know. I was going to uh, say he was very honest with the way he dealt with people and wanted to deal with people and treat people right. And mm-hmm. I found that through... Even after he passed away, that was kind of the legacy left behind. And even a couple of weekends ago, I had a guy at a garage sale that I had up in Akron. It was the same way. It was reminiscing yeah. about that in yeah. that way. Well, integrity yeah. and loyalty were just Big two very like major parts of his life and parts of who he was, his character and his values. And mm-hmm. I mean, I know that, and I did, I was young, you know, like right. I, I've seen that myself. Right. With him. I mean, so he ended up. Uh, long story short, through. The guy that was a sawyer, a good sawyer that saws logs is hard to find, and and they ended up he ended up finding an opportunity in Akron, Indiana, to mm-hmm. one of the Midwest's largest hardwood company, the Pike Lumber Company, and he got a job there. And through a reference, um, the owner of the company called Dad for a reference on Abe. And okay. And the long story short was, well, what are you going to do? Well, I yeah. don't know yet. Well, why don't you come out and take a look? I, I've heard a lot about you. Why don't you come out and take a look? Yeah. And I remember making a trip to do that. So that's when we moved to Akron. I dad moved. Did you up. guys all go down there to to make We all trip? came to visit. Did um, you drive? Yes. Okay. Um, we it was almost like a long weekend, as I recall. I want to say it was probably like Good Friday or something like yeah. that. Where we came to do the the visit and sure. stayed at a little motel longer weekend yeah so could... a, like an armpit of the yeah North Indiana not not you don't have the the Hiltons the Holiday Inn or anything <laughs> like this with the Rosedale Motel in yeah. Rochester Indiana but the uh, we came up visited long story short Dad took the job and he moved up ahead of everyone else right and then and that's what I was thinking so those are the letters that kind of came and then out during there. that was... transition Dad wrote a couple letters that I have found. Yeah. Uh, one, he wrote one to, to mom and then he found, I found one that he wrote to me and the one he wrote to me, I mean, keep in mind, I'm 71, I'm probably 10 going on 11 years old. Yeah. So it was all about fishing. It was yeah. like <clears throat> fishing and Boy Scouts and, and things like that. There's a scout troop here, got a nice, a lot of like nice lakes. There's, boy, there's a lot of night crawlers here. We'll go out and catch a lot of night crawlers yeah. and different things like that. It was all geared toward me and when dad dad actually found the house that they bought and now I still have now but yeah but they uh, dad found the house and the letter he wrote to mom you know it was like oh it's a really nice two story brick house it's got yeah. hardwood red oak floors all the way through yeah. the flooring and the birch cabinets in the kitchen and and the dimensions of every stinking room to the inch you know yeah. it was just interesting reading how he communicated and stuff to mom back yeah and the detail that he had with some of like the details of the house like you were saying with the measurements down to the inch and i think that's fascinating i think it tells a lot of letters especially 
uh, tell a lot about people, people and, and who they are just because you're not going to take the time to write something down that's not important. You know what I mean? It was important to him. So right. therefore it was important to everybody. Right. <laughs> and, and that's what I mean. It, it's like an interesting thing when you... You know, just jibber jabber. You know, we can call each other and just jibber jabber. And what'd you talk about? Oh, I don't know. We just, you Nothing. know, caught up and didn't talk about much. But if I wrote you a letter, then it's obviously going to be those are the things at that time that are important to me and like that I'm thinking about. And um, so well, see, it's cool. See, to, like, now you, you text, you uh, call someone on your telephone, you text them. There's Instagram, Facebook, all these yeah. communication things. And then you waited by the mailbox for a letter. Right. You know, and then yeah. that was the way you communicated. Uh-huh. It wasn't... I mean, I wouldn't have dreamed of calling one of my friends when I'm out of school in the summer on the telephone and say, hey, you want to go out and play? Right. No. You get on your bike, you go ride to his house, knock on the door, door, and <laughs> hope he's there. Yeah. Because the worst thing you want to do is call and mom or, heaven forbid, dad answer the phone yeah. because he's a day sleeper because he worked at night at one right. place. You know, I, no. No, you, know, you don't Don't have that. your friends come yeah. to the house. Yeah. So, so you moved to Akron, Indiana then. Um how was that transition? What was that? What time of year did you do you remember? Moved in the summer. Moved summer. in June. Uh, it was hard. Uh, it was hard because I didn't know anybody through the summer. Mm-hmm. That's one of the downsides of moving in the summer. You don't know anybody. Yeah. You move into town and you or moving rode as my an little adult. <laughs> yeah, ride your little bike around around town and yeah, look for a friend. You know, yeah. look for somebody. Yeah, and there's only you know that that stage of the game. I ended up connecting with one of the guys that. Um, Dad knew from from the lumber company is actually I call him a big wig. He was like a VP or a yeah. going to be. He ended up being you know, president of the company a number of years later. But Chris and I became friends that summer. And, yeah. And uh, I think it was that summer. It might have been when school started. I actually sure. don't remember. Yeah. Um, was was school were there differences between like West Virginia and Indiana when you moved or? Do you remember any like things that stick out to you? Not, not major. I mean, I picked up a, a, a nickname. So first, again, remember, I I was very dark complected. I tanned mm-hmm. very very easily. My my nickname early on was Max. Max. M A X. Yeah. You know, like, and I was very dark complected. Yeah. You know, so that was what a lot of people call me there in like fifth grade, sixth grade. Uh, yeah, but I don't notice or remember a lot of differences. Yeah, just that, it's been a while too. Yeah, it, it is. I'm old. Yeah. Um, what was so that puts you about what did you say fifth, fifth sixth grade. grade? Um, so what are your what is maybe the next memories you have, or what are some of the things that stick out to you as you as you got older, through middle school and into high school? Um. The boys always, at, you know, at recess or whatnot, mm-hmm. would always involved in sports. Whether you know, fall you was playing some sort of touch football or something sure. at recess or um, basketball, which that was yeah. a little foreign ball to yeah. me. I, that was much bigger. I'm used to baseball. <laughs> I get that honest, huh? <laughs> uh, baseball is just like I tried playing basketball. Tried to play basketball in junior high. I I faithfully held on to about the 15th position on the 15 man team or 12th <laughs> position on the 12 man team. Got to play whenever yeah. the score was so lopsided that no one else could hurt anything. Yeah. So I was in. But baseball, our f- basketball wasn't my forte. I love baseball. I was pretty good at baseball, and, you know, in Little League and, and all the way through. So, I, you know, that was good. Played in high school. But yeah. we, you know, where the, I think Grandma mentioned uh, about the consolidations when she, when your mom was younger yeah. to North Miami, we consolidated Tip- Tipping New Valley, Valley. Yeah. when I was uh, – the school consolidated actually my eighth grade year, but at mid semester. Sure. So the class ahead of me was the one that started out the first freshman class. Okay. But they only there were half a year together. Our class was the first one to be the full freshman class, start yeah. to finish there at the high school. Big deal to some people. I don't I've seen posts of people that talk about what a big deal it was. It wasn't a big deal to me. I didn't give a flying rip. You know, yeah, it was like I just it's just a different school we want to go go to and it's yeah. kind of a transition. But just to put in perspective for you listening, um, do you know how many people now Akron population? Oh, 
I I would say fifteen hundred people. Okay. And I would that had been about the population back then too. Yeah. I think for counting all, you know. Yeah. Very small little small little town, like you said. It's mm-hmm. got one light, one flashing light. Uh, in the perspective, middle. it was a, my high school was a consolidated high school where they brought almost. I don't want to say everyone in the county. Rochester was the county seat. Yeah, uh, it was they, like three or four different little towns little town, that kind of came Akron, together. Benton, Akron, Benton, Burkett, Benton, yeah. yeah. And my graduating class, I think, had 154 people in it. So yeah. that's perspective as right. far as the consolidation is concerned. Well, and this is something I was kind of, I, I found out I was talking to mom yesterday, too. Um, so Bunker Hill, which is the town that mom works in, it's about 900 people. So this part of Indiana that I'm talking about is just kind of where our family uh, you know, your side and my side both kind of grew up was, you know, you got Bunker Hill, which is this little tiny town, 900 people. You've got Akron, you know, it's several miles away, but this is how this area of Indiana is just kind of made up. It's these little towns. Uh, Peru, Indiana is like a bigger city. So county seat. And 12,000, I think is what uh, they said, 12, 12 to 15. Yeah, not, um, not Rochester about the way, somewhere between 12 to 15,000, probably yeah. Rochester. So we're we're talking about a very like it's just a smaller smaller towns these little towns a little slower life in some ways and in many um, ways in many ways and I mean I grew up in Sullivan when it wasn't too much bigger but kind of double the you know double those cities or Peru and Rochester almost like twenty six to thirty I think it's a little bigger now maybe but oh you grew um, up in a city yeah, yeah. It, but <laughs> it's funny because it's such a small town too. I was surprised that mom was saying that her graduating class was around, it was one of the bigger ones, but it was around 120 people, and which is about what mine was as well, so to kind of put it in perspective. Do you remember what your graduating class was? At 156, I think, was my graduating okay. class, and 154, 156, somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, and that's with the consolidation, mm-hmm. so before After then the it would have been very small. Um, high school, you said you played some sports, I know... You, baseball and wrestling. Baseball and wrestling. I wrestled my freshman year. Freshman year, wrestling was new because it was a consolidation yeah. deal. It was new to the high school. Yeah. We had a, a go-getter coach that kind of went out after everybody to do it. And and I wasn't I – mean, it was new for everybody. No one mm-hmm. had any experience in wrestling mm-hmm. whatsoever. Yeah. So it was a very, very new program. Yeah. Um, so I wrestled as a freshman and – did okay. I got my butt handed to me most of the time. Sure. But I, uh, I wrestled and then ended up, got a new coach that uh, my sophomore year, the the freshman coach that we had, um, moved on to Fort Wayne, big okay. school over there, and was going to be their wrestling coach. He was a good guy, great guy, but he, the, the freshman coach, it sounds kind of weird looking back at it, but he was hard. He pushed you. He worked yeah. you butt off yeah next guy come in it wasn't quite that way and you just kind of felt like this guy sucks yeah and we just there's there's several of us it was like you know four or five guys that just did one didn't want to put through it the effort and wasn't that a A, we weren't the best ones on the team but at the same time wasn't worth the effort so Mm -hmm. but baseball was more my forte and i was lucky enough that and just one of the two freshman players on the team that made the varsity. Yeah. And, and that was kind of by default. I was a good infielder and decent yeah. arm. And the starting, uh, our ace pitcher uh, was named Max, and, and he played third base. So whenever he pitched, I played third he base. Played so okay. I, yeah. that they needed that. The other freshman was a pitcher. He was the backup pitcher. So that was kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it was your senior year that you met Mom. Correct. Um, the summer before my senior year. Yeah. And you, was it, we were trying to figure out, or I I was trying to figure out, you met, the Swihart boys had a part in you meeting mom, correct? Yes and no. Um, like, I worked at Pike. Okay. I worked in the summer when I started. Pike 16, Lumber Company. Pike Lumber Company. Where, where dad worked. Yeah, that's where my grandpa worked. And, and uh, so I worked there in the summertime and... Every now and then during that humongous lunch hour we have, or even after school or after work, would go into, they called it the fluff, the freezer fresh, the mm-hmm. little dairy place, you know, ice cream and sandwiches and whatnot. That's where your mom worked. And and caught my eye and come to find out she was from Gilead, come to find out that's where the Swihart boys were from. So yeah. I started snooping around there with them. Yeah. So, yeah, they was kind of a... 
you there, there, there was roles in there. Yeah, there, they, were, there, there was a role, role in there. And yeah. that's what I, that's what I remember. Talk, talk me up, lie to your mom. You yeah. Know, and, yeah, <laughs> that's how it worked, you know. Because she didn't know me from that other foreign enemy school. Yeah, so. Tiffany. And then was it you took her to the dance? Was that right? Or our first went yeah, to her dance? Ultimately, I did. we did. Uh, but early on, first date was more... Going to the big city of Rochester. Yeah. You know, going to a movie. Smoking a Bandit. That's what you remember, you remember seeing? Yeah, yeah. That's Smoking funny. a Bandit. Yeah. Um, and how long did you guys date before you proposed? Oh, sweet Jesus. Um, we started dating, i say, in the summer probably of 78. And that was when your mom was going into her junior year. I was going into my senior year. Yeah. Out of high school, I went... To Purdue for a year. Yep. It was during. It was actually her s- senior prom that proposed. Okay, that's okay. that's where the that's where the deal came in. Then. Yeah, and well, fun fact. Um, so fast forward, if you listen to my mom's that I just released recently, um, my my parents are divorced. They're both remarried. Um, so my mom, I actually used the ring that you proposed to my mom with. Uh, to propose to Dana with and it had obviously mom had had some other work and had some things added to it since your proposal and it's like a you know but it's a a specific style that you know the style of the times or that I don't know what the word I'm looking for but anyway um, I don't know I think that that's really cool Um, I know some people have feelings about because you guys got divorced or whatever, but I think it was really cool. And the whole in- intention was to use that ring as a placeholder and we could use those, you know, that ring to right. design and build our own ring. Um, but when Dana put it on her finger, it fit perfectly. I never had it sized and she loved it. She fell in love with it. So that's the, that's right. the ring that, and Dana cherishes that thing and takes care of it so much. She's always afraid that something's going to happen to it or, um, you know, it's like, she goes, she's like, it's an heirloom now, you know? It's like... Because it's old. It's an antique. Yeah, it's an antique. <laughs> um, but I think that's really cool, and I think that's like a fun little fact just to, to put out there. I like I like that it was yours. I like that it was you and mom's, and um, I love that she loves it, so yeah, makes me happy. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Um, so yeah, you proposed to mom, then Purdue. What was your major at Purdue? Political science. My my childhood ambition from the time I was probably six years old was to be an attorney. Yeah. And right before, uh, timing is really kind of interesting. Back in those days, we had to, in high school, we took ASFAB tests. There was like a military ASFAB. I don't know what that, okay. I don't know what it stood for. But when you, I for some strange reason, I scored really high on those things. Some of it was pretty analytical things. I was looking at them and I scored you know, usually if you have like a hundred percentile, I was in the upper nineties, even 99, 98 percentile yeah. on two or three dimensions of that. So I was highly being highly recruited from the military. Mm-hmm. So before I met your mom, I was leaning pretty strong to go to the Navy. Okay. Uh, they would promise me the moon. I mean, yeah. I could pay me, pay my school and write yeah. my own ticket and do whatever I wanted to do in there and go yeah. through their, their program and come out as an officer sure. right away. So I was wa- highly weighing that. Well, I met your mom, then decided, well, I didn't want to go to the service, so yeah. go back to my military thing. So I wanted to be, or not my military, go back to my attorney deal. Wanted to be an attorney, uh-huh. and that didn't work out. One, yeah. a couple different reasons. There was a couple motivations there. One, we got married. Uh, you were 19, she was 18. Too young, yes. Yeah, uh, eighteen, nineteen. <laughs> I look at kids now, eighteen, nineteen years old. I think, my God, your babies. Oh, what, yeah, what, seriously. What, what was I? It was also a different time, though. It was, but, I mean, but I always say the air, young. air was <laughs> air was clean, sex was dirty back then. Yeah, you know, but that was, you know, but it, times were different. But the uh, we ended up, you know, getting married that the fall of nineteen eighty. But uh, I would my freshman years completed in you know like may of uh, of 1980 and then we got married that fall but you know i i think if i would have been i was in the school of humanities at okay. purdue and one of the requirements then in the school of humanities you had to either have is either two semesters or two years of a foreign language and while i thought i had prepped well for college i i had latin in high school mm. a couple of years of latin that's not really a good foreign language yeah. to pursue in college <laughs> 
And uh, I just wasn't good at uh, the foreign language and grasping. Yeah. I just I, for whatever reason, it just didn't click with me. I get that honest. Oh my god! Uh, <laughs> and math was one. I had to be in a school of humanities because my math requirements there was more statistics. Of course, I could I could statistics was easy for me. Vital statistics, sure. analytical statistics, and did those very easy. Give me to algebra and geometry. Uh, yeah. I sucked at that stuff, you know. So I was like, <laughs> weird. I wonder. <laughs> apple, apple tree. Apple tree. Uh, yeah, yeah apple tree. Uh, tree there. Yeah, I did not get and uh, like the algebra and stuff. So mm-hmm. that just kind of was a catalyst for like, eh, let's just go to other options. So we, yeah, we got married that that fall. Okay. And then did you you graduated from Purdue? No. No, you didn't graduate from. Purdue. I had one year. I, I served one okay. year at Purdue. Uh, yep. And uh, then quit school. Okay. And then, well, I mean, what, what happened? happened? What happened next? I don't even know what uh, to ask. So uh, what happened well, next? Th- there's that time frame and time of the year is hard to find jobs. And for whatever reason, I don't know what it was. I didn't know if I, I just didn't want to go back to Pike at that time. Sure. Which I could have. I could have. I could have written my ticket there, I think. Yeah. Uh, in that day. Uh, A, because of that, but some. You know, they wanted me to stick around and get into sales there. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the VPs at the time wanted me to do that. And I, I don't know why. Looking back, I don't know why I didn't do that. I just didn't want to do it. Yeah. And started working, God, worked at a pole building crew. Built okay. pole buildings. Yeah. Pole barns. Whew, that was a long winter. Yeah. We we did that and froze my fingers off and, and through the winter time and made my mind up that I didn't want to do that forever. But it was <laughs> one of those things. It was awful. And uh, we did that. Lived in your mom and I's first house was right out in the middle of the boonies and it had one uh, <laughs> we weren't poor but boy you start talking these stories that the house yeah. is a dump yeah but it was out in the middle of nowhere and had one heater in the middle of the house and literally the bathroom was so far away from the from the the heater that we had to have an electric heater in the bathroom because there would be literally ice on the walls in the bathroom. You know, if you get a shower, you'd freeze. Uh. You know, I don't know how it kept the pipes from freezing, but but we ended up having an opportunity to move into town, got a small place there. That's kind of a long story short, but which had, which one was the one with the groundhog? That one out in the, the middle of nowhere. Out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you, I, I love this story. Go ahead and tell the groundhog. Story. Well, your mom. You know, I go to work one day, I come home, and she says, there's something living underneath the house. <laughs> I said, you know, I basically said, you're, you know, I, I don't know what you've been drinking. No, I'm just, yeah. I don't know what's going on here. But yeah. It's just yeah. a little bit extreme here. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's nothing living underneath the house. There's yeah. a crawl space underneath here, or in a little basement. There's nothing living underneath the house. And she said, she started making this, I, she could do it today, probably today, this full of bump, 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 you know, yeah. bang, banging around going underneath there. Well, Sometime later, I, I come home and I see this huge groundhog oh. out in the front yard, and it was, and it was one of those things where the time I could get my gun to to shoot it, it'd be gone. Okay. So I got really smart. I took my little twenty two with me to work, stopped down at the corner before I, where I got home, yeah. put it in the front seat with me, and then backed in the driveway because the little sucker would be had a hole right by the entryway of going up to the porch. Okay, and. It would drop down in there. So I ended up shooting it, long story short. Then there was another one. There was another groundhog that was huge. I've never seen one that big. Probably yeah, it'd be extreme, but remind me as big as Chance is a huge groundhog. Yeah. And Chance is 50 pounds. So. Yeah. It, it uh, <laughs> might have been a little bit of extreme, but yeah. it was another one was that big. I ended up shooting too, but it, it was huge. But you ended up hearing the sound though, right? You guys like lived, it, it was. Uh, you know, the second groundhog is. It, I am getting in a, a shower, in this stand-up shower in this bathroom, and your mom comes in and says, there's a groundhog outside. And yeah. I go grab my little shotgun. And yeah. I, in a country, buck naked on the front porch shooting a groundhog. <laughs> <laughs> West Virginia roots coming out. Oh, <laughs> God, son. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of... Interesting stories. I mean, those are yeah. those are funny. I just remember it. I remember that one. That was always a funny story. Uh, yeah. Then you moved back into Akron. You moved lived. into town. Ended up getting a chance. I had a guy approach me about being a, becoming a meat cutter at a little small grocery store. And at the time, you know, it was going to be more money for for us. And yeah, and that was good. And wouldn't have to travel. And I wouldn't have to work out in that cold. Yeah, that was, it sold. 
Yep. You know, <laughs> ended up doing that for you know a couple of years and had a chance to go to the big city, Rochester, as a meat cutter over yeah. there. And, and that was like a small change. It would have been kind of a... The competitor then was Kroger's, so it was kind okay. of pushed in perspective yeah. with the size of the store, which is no longer there. And uh, so I was there for a number of years. And at this same time, you had started going to school again, right? When or I was working at the grocery that. store, went back to started going back to school, and for a period of time, I I worked full time, went to school full this time. This was in Fort and, Wayne, and, yeah. And Which was how far? How far is that? Like an, an hour's hour? drive okay. each way. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting to work full time, go to school full time, yeah, and work full time. All yeah. that, you know, and then drive ten hours a week. When it, when I first started to make kind of the smoother transition, I I got a full time schedule to qualify for financial aid by taking two credit hour classes. You know, I went to school on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I had five two hour classes through mm-hmm. the course of the day, and I had a night class on Thursday night. What was your major again? That was pastoral ministries. Okay, and what was your motivation to do to go into that field? Uh, Since the call to ministry at that point, yeah, and went back to school. It kind of worked out where I went to. I had a friend of mine that ended up going to starting to school over there, and on my day off one day, I went to school with him, kind of as a sit in and kind of yeah, that kind of as a. I'll say the courage to start making the change. Mm-hmm. So it's a hard change, the idea of working full time and yeah. doing all that. So I, the first year, the first semester, it was, you know, 12 credit hours going Tuesdays and Thursdays. Then I had to switch things up and go Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays. Mm-hmm. And the next year, because of taking Greek full time, five days a week, I had yeah. to go to school five days a week. And I would end up, because of my schedule, I, I worked out my work schedule. Your mom was working full time. And I ended up my work schedule of working like 20 hours a week or so. Yeah. On and half a day, school. one day here, work <laughs> yeah. all day on Saturdays and a partial day on Sunday yeah. morning. So that puts a definitely puts a strain on relationship, I'm sure. Yeah, you kind of like two shifts. You figure things out. I know, like yeah. Dana and I, we figure things out with like our schedule, especially coaching in the winter. It's you know, I I see her on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it almost became a habit in uh, you, during those time frames. There were times where. That's why I can zone things out. I went to, when yeah. I went to school, I'd sit at the, the, our dining room table, do my homework. I have things spread out all over the place. Yeah. And do my homework and studies. And and every Sunday afternoon, you went up, the routine was when I worked Sundays, I would get up early and go into work anywhere from 3 to 4 o'clock in the morning on Sunday and be done by 8 so that I'd go to church and then went to Grandma's for lunch. And then yep. after lunch, I came home on Sunday afternoon and did homework and studied yeah. all day long. It was, was what the routine, what I had to do. You yep. Know, couldn't, it was just too hard to otherwise to do it though. Yeah. So it was interesting. So you working at the, the um, grocery store, cutting meat, and going to school. You've got, you were, I know that I was, mom was 27, I think she said. Um, that sounds about right. When, and so you guys were married for almost 10 years before I came along. You just what, born in 87? 87. 87. Uh, you I've been close. I mean, it's close. like eight we, or nine we, years. Seven years. Yeah. You, it was okay. seven, because we were born in 80. Okay. Know, born, we, we was married in 80, and he was born in 87. Okay. Which I think is really interesting in, in... But your mom had to get married, of course. That's what all of her friends were saying, she had to get married. But yeah. it just took seven years for you to be born. Yeah, yeah. but I, I think it's interesting just because... I feel like that's almost counterintuitive to like the times in some ways. I feel like it was more common to have kids right away, or more common to have kids, and seemed like a lot of people did. It was just ours, and I don't know exactly why we opted to do yeah. that. But we well, I know Mom talked about how she really like the timing, like she really wanted to get you through school mm-hmm. and wanted that to be done before you had kids and. I know she talked about it, and Grandma talked about that experience too. You know, right. of mom coming in and, and tears being, and yeah, being all worked up because um, you know the it timing is what wasn't it is. right. So you got to roll with the punches and do what yeah. you got to do. Was I? It obviously I wasn't planned necessarily at that time. Nope. Just surprise! Surprise! Yeah. 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 Um, what What was your response or what was your reaction when you found out? You, you know, been, I I'm thinking during that time frame, mom. 
suspected that, and I don't remember. It, it was almost like it was like she was concerned about it being yeah. pregnant. So it wasn't like when she came home. Just yeah, because like, she said, she's like, I knew I had, you know, I missed my cycle that month or whatever. So, yeah. but well, it wasn't like it wasn't. I don't say anticipated or thought about. It wasn't yeah. completely out of the blue. Yeah. So it just is. Well, you got to do what you got to do. You know. Yeah. And the timing of it, you know, was interesting for a lot of different reasons. But mm-hmm. it was like, um, from from my vantage point, the timing of it is: is you were born in December, and I ended up graduating then the following, the following May. Mm-hmm. So it would have been a little bit of a, a stressful time. I, Honestly, and, and for my schooling and whatnot, the further I went, the easier it got for me because you're dealing more with your major stuff and your yeah. classes like that, so they're more of interest More interesting, for you. yeah. I, and I, I, for me, I knew my professors very well, and A, you knew how they tested, you knew how what mm-hmm. they were looking for, you knew how to take notes, you knew how to study, and yeah. made it easier at that point. Yeah, for sure. So I'm coming along, mom's pregnant, and this kind of cues where, you know, in some ways where the bulk of what mom and I's conversation was in, in our podcast together, uh, she talked about that process of, of learning about her cancer mm-hmm. and um, just that process because the, and I know you mentioned a few different things uh, along this li- along these lines of, you know, finding out that, you know, mom had this, her breast was getting large there was something wrong and she went and got it checked out prior to what this is my recollection and i yeah as i say i'm not saying everybody what i'm saying everybody's everybody's, advantage is different yeah and it's been a while ago (laughs) it's been a while i've slept a couple times um my recollection on that was probably in in the january or february before you were born in december mom had discovered a a small lump in her breast no big deal doctor said nothing to worry about kind of a probably fibrous tissue well Fast forward a couple months, and then all of a sudden, mom's pregnant, and she's noticed that lump's getting bigger. Mm-hmm. And my recollection on that is they noticed the lump was getting bigger, but because of the pregnancy, they didn't want to go in and do a lumpectomy or anything to remove it because the run the risk to the baby. Uh, yeah. And then, so what they ended up doing, they did an ultrasound. The ultrasound came back negative, so it's all good. And but over the next month or so, because of the pregnancy stimulating, yeah. day, the the lump got bigger and mm-hmm. bigger. Ended up going to Indy to do a uh, small needle biopsy, which came back. The guy, a very renowned specialist here in Indy, diagnosed it as what it was and told her specifically exactly what it's going to do, that it's going to continue to grow through the pregnancy. But then after the pregnancy, it should recede because it's going to be filling up with milk, milk glands and don't, you're not going to be able to nurse, so after the pregnancy, it should start getting smaller and, and yeah. reducing. And then we can go in and, and remove it, and sure. it'll be encapsulated. We can move it. Well, and, it, and he told her it's going to take several months for that to transpire. But something, you know, it, it did consume the breast. And from yeah. our vantage point, we I think we called it the bionic boob for a while. But, yeah. But it just it consumed the breast. And it was disproportionate she mm-hmm. covered it well but yeah. it was very disproportionate and it had to be uncomfortable oh I'm sure it had to have been it had to be miserable but it was disproportionate in size and if something happened i don't know from a physical standpoint there was a change yeah and at that point she called this guy yeah and he told her you need to get in to see somebody to get it removed and that's who when he referred her to the the surgeon that we went to see and her greatest fear was the surgeon was going in to remove the cyst, and the problem was that it had so consumed the breast that when he looked at it, it was basically it's got to go. Yeah, and, and that was in reference to the to the breast that the breast itself has got to go. Yeah, and they ended up having to do the surgery because of that. And then it was at the result of that surgery that they basically came out and told me and your grandma that. Um, this wasn't what we thought it was based on the biopsy from before. Yeah. And I know mom and grandma both had said that the doctor, um, one of the doctors earlier on, not the one who did ended up doing the surgery, but the one prior, but I don't think it was the one who did it. Anyway, one of the doctors had came out and he, grandma had said it, mom said it. He was like almost 
mad. He was pissed. No, there was no yeah. doubt about it. It was the surgeon that removed. And what was the, he mad about? Just the fact that she had cancer or uh, the fact that I think the it's process? twofold. One, one, I think initially he wanted to blame her for letting the breast get what okay. it was. Got because, it. you know, initially it was, why did you wait this long? Yeah. I was following doctor's recommendations all the yeah. way through. Um, so, and he was, secondly, he was pissed, A, because mom was young, B, yeah. had a baby at home. I think C, because... It ended up not being what everyone anticipated. Because I asked him, you know, he said, it wasn't what we thought it was. We're going to send it away for biopsy and, yeah, you know, for but cultures. He, and but he I, knew at that I time. said, what do you think it is? Yeah. Know, fresh I said, I think it's a sarcoma of some sort. Yeah. He said, we won't know anything for sure. We don't know what we need to do from beyond here. But I, I once we get the pathology report back, we'll have a, a an oncologist come and meet up with you. Yeah. And that's what happened almost, almost. To the, two days later, I found out. Yeah, I came back. It was positive, and yeah, the fencing name I remember, never forget. Sister Sacorma Philoides. I don't know why I remember that. Yeah, my mom would, knew it too, just like yeah, that. Oh, yeah. She was supposed to yeah. find that. Of course, yeah. she would. But yeah, obviously. I mean, but yeah, met up with the radio, or the oncologist, and then it was a matter of that. Met up with the, radio, the oncologist, and uh, he wanted to do some more tests to see if he, how it had spread or if it had spread and whatnot, and. And like that was a week later that we had to go back and do that. And that was like on a Thursday. She the surgery I think was like on a Monday, Tuesday, and didn't get out of the hospital till Thursday, Friday, and they wanted to see her the following Wednesday, Thursday to do tests and and uh, he wanted to well, need to do the, the the rarity of the cancer was that a specialist, any specialist in the country may have seen one or two cases. Yeah. That was a specialist. Right. That was like, he did resources. And the guy that, the, her oncologist that she had was a, a fairly renowned guy. And he went to, he went to a conference over the week after he had the results um, of the test. He had gone to a conference and he submitted the slides and what, and basically to X amount of number of other oncologists. Yeah. And what do you recommend? How would you proceed with this? 26 year old female, you know, with that, what's your recommendation? I'm just giving half of them to think about that. Yeah. Half <laughs> of them said, uh, half of them said chemo, half of them said uh, radiation. You know, some of them said chemo and radiation. And, yeah. And his recommendation was to do the chemo and radiation. And it was just, he wanted to be aggressive. Yeah. His, and he was. I and mean, he, it was rough. I mean, I so. know mom had said in her podcast basically, like, I'm going to kind of take you to the brink, you know, and, he, the brink of life and the kind of nurse bring you back. actually told me that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's they, what she said. The nurse said, yeah, was the one that said that. I raised some questions at one point yeah. when she's going through everything, and he goes, You're going to think he's trying to kill her. Yeah. But there's no second chance here. You yeah. go in, you go all in. And basically, yeah. looking back, you go all in. Yeah. You, know, you go all in right away. You do everything because that we'll never be in a position to go back and say, I wish we would have. You're yeah. doing, doing everything you possibly can now. To make sure the results are long term. Yeah. So okay, here let's let's put all this together. You're in school, doing your normal classes. Mm-hmm. I was born, so you've got a new baby. You've got school. Mom's going through cancer and all of these treatments. That's a lot, just in and of itself. On top of it. Sounds horrible. Yeah, it sounds terrible. (laughs) Uh, Do you remember kind of like your mindset or like your like where you were at with all of that? Or I mean, obviously, it's just a stressful time. And for the most part, no. Yeah, I I think I was on automatic pilot. Yeah, compartmentalize that just to get. And I'm one. Yeah, you. Yeah, I I compartmentalize things. I would do. I mean, it was almost like he's almost all in wherever you were. Yeah, if you. If you was at home or at the hospital with your mom going through whatever treatments, then mm-hmm. you're all in there. Uh, yeah. If you're at school, you're focused on that. And right. I'm not one, and and I internalize everything. I don't. I, I don't share my feelings well. I mm. did not. I know apple tree. I, I don't have. <laughs> See, a, I'm the, I'm, I don't know. I'm a mixture of both. Yeah. I, I, got a little I don't have a. Really never had a really good working vocabulary to communicate how I felt. Yeah. And for me, I don't. And I, looking back, I don't know how I felt. Yeah, it was. It was obviously stress. I mean, obviously, you know, 
That's just what you did. And you, what you, it's the place you're at and what you had you to just, do. At that stage of the game, it wasn't a matter of how you felt. You just did what you had to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're just trying to get by. Right. Because you're, you're on one hand, and I'm sure, I, and I know, on one hand, you have a wife that's going through cancer. You've got a baby at home, and, and you run into some of these what-if scenarios. Right. You know, what if things don't go well? Right. What happens? What if... Uh, well, and I believe the doctor's mom thought it was they had given her about 40% chance of making it through all of this. Is that what you recall? I don't you remember. Recall. I don't recall. I, I'm not going to say it's not accurate, but I don't remember. Yeah. I probably, if they did, I probably didn't want to hear it. So. Yeah. I mean, I right. probably tuned it out. Yep. That, that, that's what they say. I don't believe that. So we're going to go yeah. on. So. Um, so mom made it through all of that. They removed her breast. She had the mastectomy and was going through chemo, going through all of that. How did that affect you? I mean, just the... All of that, the whole the whole process of watching her go through that struggle, losing her breast. Um, I think more, you know, at the same time, your great grandmother was going through some cancer things too. Anna, who and, grandma Anna talked Lou. about. Anna yeah. Lou, sweetheart. And sweetheart. We didn't really bring that up on mom's yeah. podcast, but I, yeah, I know she, grandma had said that they were going through it at the same time. They so. were. They I w- went through the, the chemo that they did back in the day was brutal. I mean, not saying that they're not now, but... You lost your hair. They made you sicker than dogs, yeah. and it was brutal. Yep. But they went through that, and your grand, your great grandma and, and her kind of uh, cohorts in crime and that together. Yeah. And, and then, but as far and as unfortunately, how, Anna didn't. Make she it. didn't. She, she didn't make it. She succumbed to and her that, cancer. Yeah, she didn't survive hers, but uh, but a sweetheart of a gal. But as how again, it's just like automatic pilot for yeah. me. I don't. It's not a specific thing. You're like, this is how I felt about it. it was just no. Like, it's just you're just doing uh, probably more denial. Yeah. Looking back, I probably denial of, of the severity of what's going on. What I think for me, uh, it's just hard seeing the physical uh, yeah. suffering, changes, so to speak, yeah, and changes suffering. there. And so you're just trying to do everything you can to help them. You know, mm-hmm. all you can do is deal with symptoms. You can't deal with the problem. Sure. So yeah. So, what year did you graduate? 89. From, 89. from Fort Wayne Bible College at the time. And then you went into seminary? Or was that uh, I took also? classes um, through the seminary. I didn't go full-time there. But I ended up going. We, we left there after I graduated. Um, uh, graduated Fort Wayne Bible College in, uh, in May. And was still staff person at Olive Branch there south of yeah. Gilead in a rural country. Uh, and then later that fall... Uh, when I candidated and went out to Buda. Right. Which was, I was two years old. So yep. The math, the math plays out. You did a good job on, on your dates. No. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 87 to 89. Fact check. Yeah, fact check. Fact check. Yeah, fact check. Um, no, 89 would have been. Buda. Yeah. When we. Right when we at were the Buda. end of probably November, early part of December of that year. Yeah. And my grandmother in Virginia passed away between Christmas and New Year's. So I had sure. to do I did her funeral then. It's funny because I remember. Obviously, I don't remember Akron at all, but I remember Buda, and I don't know when I specifically, how old I was when I started remembering things from Buda, but I remember that house. The basement? I, I, I remember it all. Like, I, you, you, there's the driveway into our, you know, into our space. Um, there's one car garage there. Yes. And, and then there was another one that was built. It was a newer build, yes. right, in the back, yes. and there's that the rocks there and I'd go out and play in the rocks and look at the rocks and yeah. I was obsessed with rocks for whatever reason. Uh, across the street was the Casey's uh, gas station. Yep. Uh, and we'd go over there all the hang time. Out. Yeah. yeah, that was your hangout. I went for coffee every morning mm-hmm. and 90% of the time you probably went with me unless yeah. I was there early. And that was our thing growing up. Yeah. A, a, you get the, ba- yeah. the baby donuts. The, yeah. the gal, they made the donuts back here in the back and if they ever had any bad ones or fake ones or Bad ones, they kind of throw them aside. Yeah, and, See, and I don't remember those the, that little bit. Yeah, but. they did that. You know, they always call them got baby donuts. That's what they what they call them. Shane was a baby donut because they were they yeah, were basically little too. bad ones. Yeah, but what they the truth of the matter is that they ended up making baby donuts for you. <laughs> for me. I mean, yeah, if they didn't have any uh, seconds or bad ones, they would make some. That's you funny. Know, so that was 
I remember the big maple tree in the backyard. Yep. The red, the, garden. the red ones. I have one in my back backyard. Well, uh-huh. I had one in my backyard. <laughs> well, you <used laughs> still in the house, but um, <laughs> and it's it probably needs to be cut down to be completely honest. But it's something that for whatever reason I have a little bit of a connection to. Sure. Uh, it reminds me of that, and I used to. Cl- I remember I used to climb that tree a lot. Uh, I climbed that little tree in the backyard. And, um, the garden, yep, we'd go, and you you and Mom always had a big garden, and I think that, I don't know about Grandma on your side of the family, Grandma and Grandpa, but I know Mom's side oh, always yeah. had a little, huge garden. Yeah. And was that was that just a mixture of both? Did you guys both want that, or was that like a... I don't recall. Uh, I know I wanted, I remember one year we raised everything in the garden and we would have meals that everything we had out of the garden, yeah. you know, where uh, everything was freshly grown. I remember making homemade salsa. Yeah, I remember, I remember that. doing that there and we did it down in Charleston. In Charleston for sure is yeah. what I remember. But, but you know, the jalapenos and peppers and, mm-hmm. and you, know, you go back to those stories. I, I ended up had a guy I got my tomato plants off of. We got like six tomato plants out that I sip, you know, big garden. I had six tomato plants out there, all six different varieties of tomato plants. Yeah. First year I did it though, I wanted to kind of see which ones I like so that moving forward, you I knew which, know which ones, ones you'd I like. Yeah. yeah. Well, I had my, t- I don't know if you remember this, but you had to, had the tomato steaks out there buy my tomato plants. <laughs> And they were to mark which ones were which, and that way I would know which ones I liked. I and, story. and here comes uh, some little fart in. Hey, Dad, I picked these up for you so you wouldn't lose them. And you had brought in all those steaks for that had marked my tomato, or what they were, the the variety, <laughs> the big boys or the, yeah. the jubilee or whatever they were at the time. And and uh, yeah, you brought those suckers in to me, so now I had no <laughs> idea what what was what. I, I'm sure you love that. Oh, I was just yeah, I wanted to kill you. Uh, <laughs> you know, then the garden thing. Uh, the only other thing I remember that darn garden is, um, well. I'm picking green beans, you know, mm-hmm. one day, and I felt something get my foot. I'm out there barefooted in the garden and yeah. picking green beans. I felt something get my foot. Not a big deal. Wasn't yeah. too alarmed about it. To look at my other foot, and it was a stinking garter snake that went across <laughs> me. Scared to putting out of me. It wasn't that I'm afraid of snakes, but it was just like the unexpected yeah, surprise like, oh, that startled yeah. me. <clears throat> so, oh yeah, you're the adventure of someone. You go. I, I don't know who stimulated it. I might have told you, but I said, go, get, <laughs> go get a bucket and uh, you, you got this bucket and put the snake in, in there and I can still hear your mother. Um, You're so outside, right? I'm in the garden. Yeah. Windows are down in the house and I hear you go in, Mom, yeah. look what I got. We were in the what kitchen, I remember. What you got, sweetheart? And it was just like, looky. You know, yeah. It was just like, you. you get that thing out of here. And she about had a stroke and then you come out of the house <laughs> laughing your ass off. <laughs> It is what it was. You, yeah, you know. I remember, and this is this is a funny thing because even like that, I don't rem- I remember, I don't know if I actually remember, but I remember it in my head, or I've made up this like image. I have this image in my head, but I remember that house very well. So you walk in the front door to the right. There was your office. I was in the back door. Come in through the garage. Come in through the garage. And well, it's the right a little side door. door right there. Yeah, that wasn't the very front door, though. Okay. That was, like, the closest one to the driveway. But you're right. You come in that yeah. door. To the right was my office. Straight Your ahead office, was a half bath. half that, bath. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the and then the half bath in your office, and there's another hallway. Uh, yep. It made, like, a little L. And downstairs was the basement. And that's where, if you listen to my grandma's podcast with Della Paul, that's the one that she's talking about. I'd, the bouncy balls. Yeah, I had the bouncy balls. And if you go downstairs to the left was a washer and dryer, to the left of the stairs. Yeah. All the way in the back right corner was the sump pump. There yeah. were two windows to the left, those little half window, you yeah. know, things. Where I remember hornets being nested outside, yeah. ground hornets in, in those windowsill. And I'd go and watch you bat them with a... <laughs> Freaking tennis uh, racket and a racquetball racket and I'm not spray a smart them. man, um, but yeah. So then, if you go through there, there's the kitchen. And yep. It's like a little L in the dining room, um, and then straight across was the living room. Mm-hmm. TV was over to the left. There was the front door was right. over there, and then to the right was uh, 
where we'd put the Christmas tree and the couch was in the big picture window there. There's a big picture window there. Um, And it was like down that hallway, you know, if you, from the Mm -hmm. dining room, you take a left down the hallway. The first door to your left, I believe, was my room. I think it was on the first on the right. Because I was, as I envisioned. If you're coming from the living room, it, it would be. On the right, the how was that full bath? My my and room then, was on the left, and yours was right past that. And then at the very end of the hallway was right. the bathroom, and you're then right. to the right was you're the right. spare room. You're right. You're, I was thinking of. Uh, I know this house. I I don't know why I know this house right. so well. You're right. I know. Oh, mm-hmm. hey, you heard it here you're, first. The bed, the bed, your bedroom was on the left. Yeah. Ours is the next one on the yeah. left. The spare bedroom was on the right. Full yep. bathroom down in it. And it's like little things like. I was thinking um, Charleston. Yeah, Charleston was on the... Yeah, it was different. Um, no, it's like small things like I'm showing my dad my finger, but I remember I had that pig, and it was like a little... Uh, I think Pete and Kim maybe got gave it to me. But I had this little pocket knife with like a foot on it. It had some Bible verse or something on it. Psalms and, <laughs> you know, whatever. And I flipped this. I was just playing around with it. I think I was hiding from you because you, I was going to surprise you when I came home, and I was just dicking around and I wanted to cut those little loop. I wanted to cut it because I thought that would be cool for whatever reason. I'm using a knife, you know, this little pocket knife. And I sl- sliced my finger. Um, and you came home, but <laughs> here I was waiting for you and I cut my finger to like scare you or surprise you or something. And uh, I come out. I remember you guys were cleaning up. You guys were spelling back and forth. Like hospital, you know, stitches and hospital because I'm running my finger under there and I'm crying. I remember in the bathroom. Um, I don't know if you'd been gone for a couple days or what that was or gone. I don't remember if you were just gone for the day and came back or what it was. But I remember I got two stitches in my finger because I... Remember sliced going, open. I remember going to the hospital and taking you to that, but I don't remember all that. Yeah. The details of oh, I, rem- I, rem- yeah. Gosh, I remember I could I could tell you exactly. You guys were spelling each other. I can see the because the sinks right there, toilet, and yeah. then the back was the bathtub. I I mean I know I don't know how old I was. You know, for the fact that I we moved there when I was two. Well, we moved there when I was two, and we we moved away when I was it was halfway through my first like grade seven. year. Mm-hmm. So it would have been like that end of that fall. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, do the math, whatever that is. But I just remember that place. Very little, yeah. Yeah, I remember it so well. Um, so you were, this is was your first job as a, as a minister, as a pastor. Full time, yeah. Full time with the Church of God. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember that too. It was Casey's was straight across. If you take a right, you go down that street and just down the road just a little bit on the right there was the... Yep. Was the church a little old it's church? Not, it's, the church is still there, but they've they've relocated it. Now. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I remember I remember all the details there. You walk in, there's a little coat area, you know, the green yeah, area to the that. left, and a little short set of stairs, and they had the little wheelchair lift thing yeah. that would go up and the stairs down, and yeah. basement down there, and then there's yeah. a couple little classrooms, and uh, I just I remember all that so well. It's like it seared in my brain those little. Those little pieces. I probably know that better than, in some ways, better than I remember. I remember Charleston pretty well, too. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That one's, like, very vivid in my head. And I remember going out in the back, you know, like I said, in the they built that garage. I think before we moved in, but it was new. Probably. It was really new. Yeah. Um, and I would, those rocks, I would do the same thing at Grandma's house. I would go and I'd look through the rocks and whatever. There were certain ones Find that... fossils. Yeah, there were yeah. certain ones that, like, stuck out to me, but I love doing that. I've always been... I'd go out there and spend hours doing that. Um, one thing we didn't mention is you're an only child. So yes. maybe that came out here, but I, I'm i also an only child. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I know mom, after our podcast, she had kind of mentioned, because she never really mentioned that. She had said a couple things about um, how, you know, like, basically she wasn't allowed to have kids. Uh, or they Strongly didn't discouraged. Want her, yeah, they didn't want her to have kids. Um, they thought that... It could stimulate whatever. They didn't know what happened and right. why things happened the way they did and the timing, so... They thought the, the hormones could have pushed her. Yeah. The change in hormones, so... 
that was the decision. Did was that like a a very solid decision where you guys were just like, no, we're not doing that. We're not going to have kids. Or it was more of a we can't type yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I've I've been an only child um, growing up as well, and so I mean I think I just had to get creative and how I what I would do and go play and climb the trees and go play in the rocks or whatever it was. You entertained yourself quite well. I mean that yeah. was never never a big deal or. I know your mom would go do stuff or had, you know, things that she did. And there'd be times you'd sit, you know, come out play in my office or mm-hmm. I don't know what cartoons you watched at the time. Who knows? I don't know either. I things. remember that was, Buda was when I first got a Super Nintendo. I still own that Super Nintendo. Probably worth a fortune. Maybe, if it still works. I want to play the games, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had that and... I remember, I don't know, there's like little things, gifts that I remember getting. I remember playing with those Legos. Um, pretty sure that's where in Pete and Kim, Pete and was the one that Pete made, made it, right? Yeah, Pete made a, uh, like a Lego table. Yeah, I still have that at Mom's. Uh, I want to keep that. That's like something that's, that's cool. important to me. Um, yeah, I remember those things. I remember that little uh, fire truck deal. Uh, maybe I got that at Charleston. I don't remember. I thought it was Buda. And it had the little thing. I still see kids, like Sam's kids and stuff, have these like little toys. And the Brigger boys have these like big fire truck things that they love. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's just it's it's a kid makers. thing. Yeah. yeah it's, it's obviously something that grandparents buy for their kids because a parent would never buy it for themselves. Yeah. You know, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Um, so, again, we kind of touched on it here. I was midway through my first grade year and I know we talked about it yesterday a little bit but you decided to for a variety of the the red tape and the politics I guess in some ways of of being in part of the church and um, you had decided that it was just time and and to move on and yeah. you weren't going to stay there yeah. so you'd been there for how long five years five years and we made a transition away from Buda from after five years and we moved uh, ultimately to uh Within, right at the, I'd say almost like January, probably right after Christmas in January of, uh, I guess what that had been, uh, 95. Mm, okay. And then, that'd been about right, January of 95, and then we moved to Charleston. And that was... Uh, Home of Eastern Illinois Panthers. Eastern Illinois Also University. where Tony Romo, Tony mm-hmm. Romo went to college. Just yeah. some little fun facts there for you. I think there's been a couple other actually uh, big athletes, like maybe Olympic athletes that have came from there too. I remember hearing of some others, but that's the one that always sticks out to me. There was a couple. One yeah. of them you met. I don't even remember it probably. Yeah, probably not. There was um, the interesting story in Charleston. You were like a shadow. I mean, if I there were, there wasn't any place I wouldn't take you or take. Yeah. Didn't feel like I could take you. And I remember we had I had a friend, a person that I knew uh, from Charleston that passed away unexpectedly. He's a younger man. Uh, he happened to be in a biracial relationship, which was kind of I don't say unique, but it was not as common then as it was now yeah. or accepted uh, as accepted and but it was charleston so it was a bigger city college town yeah. that helped and but I, I went fishing with this guy great guy uh, actually it was the guy from the church that kind of hooked us up and was in a fishing tournament together yeah and uh, but he died unexpectedly and i remember going to his funeral and i needed or uh, to his visitation one evening and for whatever reason, I don't know whether it was that we had to or chose to, but you went with me to the funeral home. Yeah. And you did your own thing back in the back and yeah. it was fine, never big any big issues. And there was somebody that you met there that night that you were trying to describe to me. And you were going through great details. And your comment to me was, he had the biggest hands I've ever seen. <laughs> and his eyes... I don't remember big. this at all. No, yeah. It's funny. He had the biggest hands I've ever seen. Well, who was it? Do you remember his name? And you went, I don't remember his name. Well, what did he look like? Well... That hasn't he, changed. I can't he, remember. He was tall. I mean, you went through all these descriptions. Okay. Yeah. All these descriptions that you, you, you could have given me. And... And then finally, I, I I hit a name, and I and I there wasn't the name that resonated with you. I said, "Was he black?" Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it was John Kraft. He was he wasn't 
an Olympic athlete. He was? He, it, yeah, he, he did something in the Olympics. Or he yeah, either, okay. It was either with the Olympics or he qualified for it. I can't yeah. remember how it was. But the unique thing was that John would have been probably one of two or three people yeah. at that visitation or funeral that would have been black. But you never thought right, as to even kid, describe and... him as... Yeah. A black man. And, and the nothing social... that mattered. And I felt good later on looking at it. You were colorblind because yeah. it didn't matter to you. Well, and I I think it's really true. Um, just the society, I think kids just don't care. Yeah, I agree They don't that. care. It's learned. I think it's a learned behavior. It's taught behavior. And we, we treat people differently. Or, um, you know, even, even in an attempt to be politically correct and and to do, you know, to say the right things and do the right things as a parent. And I think that sometimes we just, that's how we teach kids to look at people differently in some ways. I think the best story I've ever ever seen is there's two kids that are like kindergarten that were best friends Mm -hmm. and they wanted to get their hair cut together so the teacher wouldn't be able to tell them apart. One was black, one was white. Yeah. But they had to get their hair cut the same because they... They didn't, they, want the te- they didn't want the teacher to tell them apart. That's, that, and that's a beautiful story. It's yeah, so it cool. really is. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're in Charleston, and I lived. we lived in Charleston from halfway through first grade year till the end of my sixth grade year. Five years. It would have been right at the five-year mark yeah. again, uh, transition from Charleston. Then we we lived uh, away from the church. We, we stayed in Charleston for a short period of time. A, your mom was working at the school, mm-hmm. um, and then we were transitioning. We we're going to move to Sullivan. Yeah. Uh, Sullivan primarily because we had mutual friends down there, Eddie and Eddie and Diana, yep. uh, that we were going to move down there. Yep. I remember, let me tell you what I remember in Charleston. So I remember the things I remember is the you you guys had the um, the build that the at the church. Yeah, the new and church. we lived in the parsonage right yeah. next door. Right. So we had this big blacktop road. Uh, Parking lot uh-huh. and um, rollerblades. I would rollerblade around there all the time. Uh-huh. I'd ride my bike all the time, and I'd be home. Sometimes mom would be working, and I'd just be home, and you'd be at the office. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if I need anything, I'd just go over there and find you right. and, and ask. But I just did independent. Things. Yeah, I was very independent throughout those times, and uh, I remember that dirt pile in the back. <laughs> and I would I'd put those like ramps. I'd try to like ramp my bike over there and off that dirt pile, and um, I'd build these little ramps and stuff. I'd go in the back and where these other dirt piles were, where they were. We lived in the middle of nowhere. It was in, the, right. in cornfield, beans and Behind. corn all yeah. around us, and they'd alternate throughout. Um, and I'd go up there and I like had fishing line and I'd make booby traps up top. Of like, I'd dig a hole and be like, pretend like GI Joes or I something. I didn't and know that. I know. So, yeah, that was that was my independent days. <laughs> uh, I would. I loved bugs when I was growing up, so I would go out and I'd catch the grasshoppers. We had a plague of grasshoppers <laughs> a couple of years there, um, and I'd catch those and put them in little, you know, those little bug boxes. We had herb for years. Herb, yep. Which herb Pete salamander. Gate found Pete, right, and uh, Pete found a salamander in one of his. Uh, I yeah. think uh, grain bin areas. He brought a salamander home in a actually it was a Coke bottle. Yeah, so it fit in the top of the. It the was top very of a small, Coke maybe two or three, like a newt yeah, uh, salamander. It's a, there's a salamander. I think it was the technical name is like a tiger salamander. Yeah. If you look them up, it was really really one. small. But we had her in a, like an aquarium for years. Yeah, and that thing was probably grew to be about what six inches i mean oh at least it was it was probably closer to eight inches probably yeah was, i mean like i'm doing right now i'm putting my yeah, was, my thumb and pinky out and it's it was with long tail and yeah big, big old head big around probably is a half, half dollar. dollar yeah um big old thing and i had that for years um and eventually he i even found another one in our backyard before we had moved it i put it in the water dish and with herb yeah with herb and herb ate it and herb ate it yeah <laughs> It was so funny, oh, but yeah, I had that. I had a, uh, but yeah, I just remember those those things at backyard and I'd hit the golf ball around out there. I remember pegging Paul in the back of the head one time, <laughs> first time I ever hit the ball off the ground, <laughs> and it just so happened to fly right in the direction of all you guys were sitting there around the table and popped him right in the back of the head, and uh, I'll just, I I'll never forget that. I don't know, just those little things, that country road. I remember uh, a snowstorm one time, a really bad snowstorm. And it's 
beautiful at night there, you know. I mean, the mm -hmm. snow drifts were always huge, and I loved playing in the snow drifts. But there was one night, and we were going to go for a drive just to see where, I don't remember what was going on. We were going to, for a drive somewhere, and we all went out. And it was dark, and the shed in the back, uh, we, like, walked around, and there was this little fox, a uh, uh, red-tailed fox, you know, those big old fluffy... And I remember the lights were on, and he was just standing there, just so prestige and beautiful. And the white snow, just this fresh powdered snow. And I, I don't know, that's a very vivid memory of mine. Um, For some reason, I don't recall. I could, it probably happened, but yeah. I don't remember. It hit my radar. Yeah, the, I don't know. I just remember, like, the marigolds in the side of the... the yeah. Fox. yard there yeah. and there was that little tree off to the left and we had a um in the backyard was the uh what was it like the sewage and you had to have that yeah there's kind of a side yard floor. it was a different i can't remember what they called it now but it was a a different kind of an above ground yeah septic tank. septic tank yeah yeah it's gross but uh um, filtered <laughs> yeah so yeah we ended up you left your pastor there for five years or so four years and then we was running at five and we we left when we moved down to the the parsonage to a rental yeah. property for a couple months to get you through school and then we were going to move mm -hmm. uh because that was like in uh like right at january and then we didn't move away from there until may yeah and then we moved to sullivan that was when we were, we had to put Bo down was our dog growing in up in charleston yeah yep. but, uh, but my Bo. his older and i was yeah it was uh Oh, Bodini, yeah. Uh, like a year older than I was. He was yeah. 13, I think. I was like, ended up being 12 when we put him down or something yeah. like that. And it's very possible. I remember uh, there, I remember riding my bike in that little, you know, subdivision, that little cul-de-sac there. I That winter, we had much more snow, and I'd go out and knock on people's door or shovel their... You would disappear. Uh, I remember that. You'd dis disappear during the day with the snow shovel over your shoulder and just be gone, come yeah. back, warm up, go back out. I'm going back out shovel. Okay, well, we didn't care. We didn't have to micromanage. It's a safe neighborhood. And yeah. Whatnot. And, and uh, you'd come back, hey, I made $25, you know. Yeah. Just first one thing and the other. What was always, what was cool about that looking back, though, was that when finding out from people later on that I know you had a couple – people that never answered the door but you shoveled their, dri their driveway anyway yeah and later on it wasn't that they didn't answer the door they weren't home or whatever and yeah they talked about how nice it was to come home and have their driveway shoveled out and yeah. not know who did it and i think you made more money from those people than you did from yeah. people that you paid you five bucks or whatever to yeah them. well so, and i always remember they had asked me how much i was charging usually and i I just said, whatever you think I'm worth, you know, like, whatever, whatever you think, you know, and I just do it. And they're like, okay, well, just pay me afterwards. Some will, some will give you a couple bucks, some will yeah. give you five, some will give you more. Here's you a know? 20, you know, yeah. some people would give me, yeah, it was always different. But yeah. I remember that was the first year that I had ever bought Christmas presents on my own for the family. So, right. like, um, you know, grandma and grandpa and you guys and I, I just remember that was the first I think Stephen and Tammy at the time and Probably. I just remember that um, yeah and then we moved to Sullivan Indiana mm -hmm. which is where I w did 7th 8th 9th 10th 11th 12th grade so that would be about six years yeah. that I lived there um, 7th grade 7th and 8th grade was really hard for me and I'm sure it wasn't any hard any less hard for you guys right um Moving, obviously, it's hard. It sucks. And I know that we moved there because we had friends there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Eddie and, and Diane. Um, and that was your decision. You had decided to kind of, like, leave the ministry and, and kind of yeah. that was the end of that chapter of your life. So yeah. you were in the ministry for how long? Uh, probably full time, twelve years. Uh, 12 years. Part because I was full time, full time going senior school, pastor, yeah. so to speak, for ten years and a couple years as an associate. Okay. Um, yeah, then we went there, and I I don't even remember what all you guys did. Um, I just I think I was so trying to figure out my own stuff. But I something I really appreciate and value, and I know that things have changed these this day and age, and. I live in the cities. I've always lived in the city, so it's different than like living in some of these small towns. But the freedom that you guys gave me, I don't feel like it's common anymore. Um, 
I would, I just remember I had my bike and I'd bike wherever I wanted to go. I mean, I had stipulations, but it was the freedom to kind of, it's a small, small little town, yeah, what, 26 to 30,000? things have changed. I think some of it is, uh, I hate to word it this way, a, a young boy is probably more safe, is safer than a For young sure. girl uh, yeah. being out and about. There was a trust issue. I mean, we trusted you. Uh, prob- probably could talk and have reasons not to now, but there. Maybe, but even I mean, the worst thing I think I did was Mama told me not to to drive or ride my bike to the lake, the Sullivan and, Lake, and, and I did, did that twice. I know for sure. That's probably the worst thing I had done. I I remember. I don't think I ever told you guys, but it would have been eighth ninth, probably eighth ninth grade. It would have been eighth seventh eighth grade somewhere in there. I remember coming down the alley. Uh, coming from like the church or the newsstand up there and I would slow down and look both ways but there was a car there were cars parked and I had I didn't see the truck and the truck I ran into the truck like popped it I mean I hit it hard and I fell and it busted my butt and I don't didn't say a word to you guys about it and I remember playing soccer and my butt my tailbone I I had messed up my tailbone or bruised my tailbone really bad and messed up my back and I, it hurt so bad but I wasn't bound to tell you guys that I had done anything and <laughs> that anything had happened um, which was an interesting one um, yeah I don't know I, I one of my most favorite memories just growing up in general with you has always been you know we talked about it with Casey's but in in uh, you know in Buda and then in Charleston we did the same thing you'd go to the Amco right Amco for a while, gas the Amco gas station, or I went to Hardee's, yep. uh, another place, Hardee's. Well, we went to Amco a lot, yeah. but Hardee's was also one, well, just kind of depending if you wanted breakfast or not, right? And we get those frosted raisin but biscuits, biscuits yeah. so dang good. And coffee. Um, but at in Charleston, I'd go, we'd go to the gas station, and uh, Rita yeah. was her name. And yeah. I only remember that because of the song, the Mambo Number no. 5. <laughs> And she used to always, like, that was, like, the way, yeah. I don't know, something she She's a sweetheart, yeah. Yeah, and we'd she, sit there. She had a little stool at the end where the checkout counter was. And yeah. It was the same group of people that came in there every, every day. morning. Yeah. I'd get my little Jones soda or whatever it was that I was drinking that day, and, you know, a donut or whatever, different things every every morning. But I always, you'd wake me up and we'd go. That was just our thing. And it's always been a thing. And even when we went to Sullivan, it was the same thing then. We yep. went up to the newsstand and... You do your crossword. I drink my cappuccino, and you know, it's always been for me. It was a matter of, uh, I'll say, socializing and networking with the community and whatnot. That I did that in Buda and did it in Charleston. Yeah, and just even if we moved to Sullivan, it was just kind of a habit. You know, yeah, it was just like what we would do. You know, get yeah. up, go get coffee and you know, you know some toast or donut yeah. or whatever in the morning. But it kind of a habit, and you know, I'm. I'm like Pavlov's dog in some ways. I'm kind of a creature of habit. I yeah. Guess, you know. You get I, that honest from Grandma. Grandma the same way. Yeah, in some aspects, yeah. I, I really, now even like thinking about that and how fond of a memory, and I've got the flexibility to do it, like I'd really like to find a place like that when I move down to Florida. I've got the time, you know. I've got the freedom to do some of those things in the beginning, at least until I figure and out And it's what funny, sometimes those things happen not Naturally. intentionally. Yeah. It, it's not intentional. I mean, it is like, I, I don't know why I started going into the Amico. I mean, it's where I got my gas. It's where I... I Creature of habit. Yeah, I, yeah, I do that. You start talking to people, and one one minute you're there, and you linger and chit-chat with the guys for yeah. three or four minutes, and the next thing you know, you're there for half hour. Yeah. You know, and then every day it's a half hour. Yeah. You, know, you just... Do it, you know, yeah. and it, it becomes a habit. And it's just like, uh-huh. where were you yesterday? Well, yeah. you know, type yeah, thing. Yeah, you okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> miss you. Yeah. Um, so Sullivan, we were in Sullivan. I was involved in soccer. You guys took me to Terre Haute. I remember I was on those traveling leagues. And yeah. I look at that now, and I, I know that that was like, financially, that was like, I know it was tough. And I, you've never said it. I've never heard it. But I know, like, just... The prices of things nowadays and knowing those different things, but you guys always provided those things yeah. for me and never travel soccer, travel sports in general. And I and I say it with kids now and and parents now. I mean, you know, Chanel did travel, Austin softball. did soccer, and she did soccer softball. It's all 
uh, it is expensive. Yeah. I mean, you've got it's not only the valuable experience that you get through it. And but it's one of those situations that I look at it as like, um, it's not only the, the cost of the uniforms and the registration fees, then it's the weekly stuff. It is expensive. I mean, yeah. you don't look back and you do it and change it for anything in the world. Yeah. It's like, just do what you have to do and you just kind of roll with the punches. You go to, mm-hmm. you got this game that, you know, we're from Sullivan and we're going to, uh, gosh, we're going to Indianapolis, you know, which is yeah. not huge. I mean, you don't a couple have hours. Yeah. You, know, I you mean, talk about a weekend, you spend a whole week, there's your weekend shot. Like. It was worse when we was in Charleston and he was doing travel. Yeah. Because those were, I had, with all these soccer games, they're starting at one o'clock on a, on a Sunday and yeah. there I am not really flexible on Sundays. Uh, yeah. And having to make arrangements for that, you do, you know, I mean, and there it was one of those things. Their their leagues that they were in, they were in Champaign, Urbana, Peoria, yeah. Springfield. They were yeah. two hour away drive. Yeah. I mean, that you had to do. Well, I played baseball, and I yeah. ended up playing all stars travel yeah. baseball. Yeah. So I did baseball and soccer, and I remember eventually you guys were like, "Got to pick one. Can't yeah. do it. You know, it's just too much." And I get that now more than I ever do. And uh, then. You know, when I got to high school, I played soccer out through middle school because the, they didn't have a, a soccer program, uh, and the soccer program was two years old. So you did the travel in, so, yeah. in Terre Haute with the Flyers. Yep. Yeah. And then I got to high school, I was, you know, the young buck coming in and felt mostly, pretty good about most that. Most experienced you know? soccer player that yeah. they had. Yeah. Second year the program had been going and played soccer, and that was when they had, a couple of those guys had ended up talking me into wrestling and I got into wrestling and started that and um, it was my sophomore year when you and mom uh, split up of high school and it had been like December of that like my sophomore year around that time I think around November yeah yeah November December and then um, so that added you know some a little bit of dynamic, an interesting yeah. yeah dynamic and one of the things that I I think has impacted me most and one of the reasons that I'm a, a, a wrestling coach or that I've been a coach for so long and wanted to coach one of many reasons I obviously love the sport but my coaches I didn't realize it until I've gotten older so of how much they were there they were there and I could get teary eyed just thinking about it like they mean so much to me Tom LeHay and uh, Roy mm-hmm. Monroe both mm-hmm. of those guys just they stepped up so big and it was the simple things of, you can't do it now. I look at that and I'm like, man, you get in so much trouble if you did some of those things. I mean, I'd just go over to Roy's house and he'd be like, just stay the night here and we'll leave in the morning and go to this wrestling tournament. Okay. You know, mom would stay at Roy's. Okay. We'd get back from a wrestling tournament and he'd have the boys over and we'd come over and play, play poker. <laughs> you know, and I'd pay for my gas by, by winning some games <laughs> of poker. That was one of the things I did. You know, you can't, it's just it's, stuff yeah. that you can't get away with nowadays, but... Um, or a, Tom taking me fishing and right. uh, he'd take me fishing one time and then he took me over to his house and we shot my uh, my bow and arrow uh, and so we shot my bow and arrow in his backyard and went sat and waited for turkeys to see if turkeys would come through there um, and ended up not being anything but you, you know, know I, just little things like I'm that I'm grateful that for those guys to uh, being support to you but it for me, I, I was able to be have a good relationship with those guys too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you, and I know you did, and yeah, it's just it's just really cool. I, I see those moments, and I, I really appreciate that, and them checking in on me. And uh, I think sports was a big thing. I I don't I didn't realize maybe some of those things. That was just an outlet for me. I think sports were, um, especially during that time. You know, it was hard, but I don't I don't remember it being hard. That part being hard. It was just how much I put into my sports. I. I think I just put everything into that, and that was like my distraction and my like kind of the denial mode as well. Yeah, probably. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you've worked a few jobs throughout that time in Sullivan uh, from different places in Terre Haute and traveling back and forth. And well, at that time I worked. You know, I just to get, put in perspective, where we gotta wrap up things. We're at eighty-eight minutes, so 
Um, real quick, I worked at the Indiana Business College. Yeah. I, was a, I started out as a student service coordinator, student service coordinator yeah. and became the director of education there. My background of kind of in ministry kind of facilitated the student services coordinator because of just being a support. Yeah. I don't call it a social worker, but kind of support. And then you get, um, there was a transition there and I ended up becoming a real estate agent. Yeah. Doing sales and that, you know, ended up did that for a number of years. But at the end time, the thing I had to be careful of where there was, it was all commission based and be yeah. very careful and I had to yeah. look for other stuff too later on. So, um, you got less than 30 seconds. Anything you want to leave us with? Anything nah, I think we hit the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. We, we more. Well, I'm sure we'll do this again, but thank you dad for being on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time. Tell me a little bit about your life and your story. Remember everybody do good, make a difference. I love you all out there. Peace.